Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for having us once again. Um, thank you, Pastor Shola and Pastor Bimbo. Thank you. Thank you, Liberty Church London. Thank you. It's such an honor, like I said before, to be here and to bring you God's word. Um, Pastor has already shared with us, and I'm still just going to share with the married folks a bit. And, and I just want to share quickly on some very simple things. Maybe they're not things you haven't heard before. I'm hoping that I'm just here today to do the work of the Holy Spirit, to bring to your remembrance some of these things which I believe you must have heard before. Um, they are not unique or unusual things, but they are things that I guarantee if you apply to your marriage, you will make the most of your marriage, which is what I'm here to share with you today about making the most of your marriage. So like my husband, I usually also have a pattern and I want to work with the M's. And this time it's about making the most of your marriage. So what do you need to do? So number one, and I'm jump right straight into it. Number one, make sure that God is the center of your marriage. If your marriage is going to work, you have to make sure that God is the center of your marriage. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 33, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says, all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Everything. Everything that you need in marriage will be added unto you. So whether it's money you need, it will be added. Whether it's children you need, it will be added. Whether it's companionship you need, it will be added. If it's friendship, it will be added. If it is peace, it will be added. Whatever you need will be added if you seek first. It means that you can seek it second, but God says, give me my rightful place in your home. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, meaning his way of being and doing right, his way of doing things. There are many ways to do things, but God says, if you seek first my kingdom and my way of doing things, then all the things that you need will be added onto you. And it's no different in marriage. The funny thing is that a lot of times we have a way of building our marriage around each other. And that can be very dangerous because that's too much to put on any human being. I always tell people that no one can solve all your problems except Jesus. And even he had to die first. So you can't put the responsibility of your joy or your peace or your satisfaction of in marriage on your partner. So one of the things you must do, and when I say make sure that you put God as the center, it means that there will be the temptation not to put him as first or to put him as the center. You have to build your marriage around Christ, not around each other. Um, one of the things I know about putting something on God is that the Bible tells us that God upholds all things by his the word of his power. One of the things that will happen when you put it in God's hands is that God will sustain your home. The Bible says that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And when this foundation of your home is built on Christ, nothing will be able to destroy it. Nothing. And if you read uh, Matthew 7, and I want to read it to you in the message translation, because now that I say build your marriage uh, and center it around Christ, someone is asking me how. And I'll tell you, there are very, they're very simple ways, two simple things that I know you've heard over and over again, but I want to reiterate it because it's so essential, especially if you're planning to have a kingdom marriage. You have to build your marriage on the word of God and on prayer. Those are the two things I guarantee you cannot fail. Now, like I always say, there's always the spiritual side to everything. There's a spiritual angle to everything that we do. And contrary to what most people think, you don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. So you are first a spirit man. And so everything that you do must first be settled in the spirit realm. So if you have a peaceful home in the spirit realm, it just manifests itself in the physical. And you now need to do some things to maintain that. But if you haven't first settled it in the spirit realm, you will find yourself struggling in the natural. So what do you do? You use the word of God to sort out your home. Matthew 7 from verse 24, I read the message translation. It says, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. And Jesus is speaking here. He says, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words. Okay, they are words to build a life on 
and a marriage on, I dare say. If you work these words into your life, it says you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. It says rain poured, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. It is the thing that the house was fixed to that kept it. Because rain came. Rain always comes. The river will flood. The storms will come. It says even a tornado will hit. It says, but nothing moved that house. Why? Because it was fixed to the rock. And Christ is that rock. So if you fix your marriage on the rock, no matter what comes against it, whether insufficient funds, whether infertility, whether interference from friends and family, even infidelity, if that marriage is fixed to the rock, things may come and try to shake it, but it will stand. It will stand. Verse 26. It says, but if you just use my words in Bible studies, which we do most of the time, and you don't work them into your life, it says, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. If your house is not built on the word, if your, the house, your home, your marriage is not built on the word of God, what happens is when it has little challenges or major challenges, it will collapse. So I'm telling you now to start by building your marriage on the word of God. So whatever God says you should do in marriage is what you should do. If you go to Ephesians 5, the Bible tells you clearly, it starts to break down what is expected of us as men and women. It says men, it says every man, let me read the amplified version of Ephesians 5.33. It says, however, each man among you, without exception, okay? So this is not, there's no partiality in this case. It says every single one of you, as far as you are a husband, okay? You are to love your wife as your very own self. The way you love yourself. God is not expect you to love them more than you love. He said the way you love yourself, love your wife. Let's even start from there. It says with behavior that is worthy of respect and esteem. Always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness. This is the Bible speaking. If you're always seeking the best for her, you won't hate her. If you're always seeking the best for her, you won't insult her. If you're always seeking the best for her, you would, you would think of her first. You would think of her first. You would think of ways to bless her, ways to love on her, ways to build her self-esteem, ways to help her, not put the load of the whole marriage on her. It says with an attitude of loving kindness. means that you do all these things and you don't even brag about it. And your behavior is worthy of respect, meaning that it's easy for her to respect you and to value you. And then it says, and then you, the wife, must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him, she prefers him, and she treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. God expects both of us to play our part in marriage. Marriage is not created for one person. Marriage is created to be a blessing to two. It says two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. A good reward for their labor, not individual labor, for the joint labor. Two of you will be blessed. God expects that your marriage will be a blessing to both of you, not to one person. So God expects that for that marriage to work, two of you have to play your part. So you as the man, you need to love. Not to say the woman should not love. But God is saying the one thing that the man may struggle with is loving her the way she needs to be loved. So you need to find out what her love languages are. To understand what language she understands love in. Is it in gifts? Is it in spending time with her? Quality time with her? Is it in acts of service helping her out? He's saying be more practical about your love. Don't just say the words, but show her. Show her how valuable she is to you. And you as the wife, make it easy for him to love you. Treasure him. Anything he does for you, celebrate it. God is saying both of you play your part and the marriage will work. So you build your marriage on the word, but then you build your marriage on prayer. You must have your time alone with God. Marriage does not replace your quiet time. You must have time where you pray by yourself. And then you have time when you pray for your partner. And then you have time when you pray together. There are three different things. 
So God expects you to pray for yourself. He expects you to pray for your spouse. And then he expects you to pray together. Now, I'll tell you a little story. For, two, for Pastor King and I are very different individuals. Um, he's a night person. I'm a morning person. So Pastor King is going to bed at 4 a.m. I'm getting up at 4.30 a.m. So we barely have those mornings where we do the whole oh, let's pray together in the morning every day. And that bothered me for a while until God said, the same way that you make appointments to do things, why don't you make an appointment to pray together? And so I started making an appointment to pray with him. I became more intentional. Now he would have his quiet time on his own. I would have my quiet time on my own. But we had special times when we would come together. And I'm not talking about family altar where you have the kids and then you are doing it because you want the kids to pray with you. I'm saying two of you spending time in the presence of the one both of you love the most so you are seeking the one together you are seeking the Lord together and that usually helps because you are vulnerable your dreams are expressed in the place of prayer so the things you want to tell God your partner is literally there eavesdropping so there's more intimacy built there so praying together is essential and even when you're praying for your partner whether you're a man or a woman there's a difference between Praying about them and praying for them. Now, praying about them sometimes is complaining about them. Most times it's complaining. But praying for them is speaking into their future, speaking into their destiny, speaking into the plans and the purposes God has over their lives and how you want them to achieve it. So the first thing you must do to make the most of your marriage is to make sure that God is the center of your marriage. Not each other, but God. Now, the second thing you must do if you're going to make the most of your marriage, you must make time for each other. Let me tell you one of the big problems we have in marriage. It is, in fact, I think most of us are guilty of this. It is the sin of familiarity. When you have become used to your partner, used to having them around you all the time, you don't make special time. You don't make a big deal of special occasions. Oh, we celebrate love every day, so we don't have to have a special day. Oh, we don't have to do Valentine's. Everybody's doing Valentine's. No. You must keep chasing each other throughout the marriage. The same way you would spend time dating before you got married, you have to continue dating even after you're married. So make time. Interestingly, because my husband and I are so busy, we actually filling our date nights into our calendar. So my staff know that you can't fix an appointment at that time. That time is my time. I have time with my husband. My husband has booked an appointment with me. So you can't fix time. You can't fix any meetings at that time. And we have to do this to be, you have to be very intentional if you're going to make your marriage work. You can't just leave it a chance. You can't just say, let's see how it goes. It's not going to go. So what you need to do is be intentional. So you plan the same way you plan time at the office, plan meetings, plan date nights with each other, plan family vacations, plan couple vacations. Because there's a difference. When your kids are on vacation, you're not really on vacation, especially if they are young. But if it's just two of you, you need time to relieve the moments. So it's time you spend with each other, checking up on each other, checking up on your dreams. Are you still happy? Do you still love me? Are there things you'd like me to still do with you? Do you have dreams that I don't know about? Are there new things that are bothering you? Do you have new hobbies that I need to be involved in? Talk to each other. Those are times where you can be apart from everyone, but you can be in each other's faces and it's not um, it's not about anybody else but two of you. So find the time, okay, to make time for each other. So the first thing is make sure God is the center of your marriage. The second thing is make time for each other. Now the third thing, if you're going to make the most of your marriage, is something I call, in fact, let me put it this way. Make all your decisions together or with each other in mind. Now this is a rule that has helped me in marriage personally. When you make up your mind that all your decisions will be made together or with that person in mind, it makes the marriage easier. You know why? Because as an infidelity recovery specialist, I've come to realize that most times when people make certain mistakes, especially that lead to infidelity, one of the things I found out is that they were not making that decision with their partner in mind. If you are thinking about the fact that this thing I'm about to do this meeting I'm about to have in this hotel room with this person, if my partner hears about it, what would they think? Most times they're not thinking. And most times the betrayed party would ask, were they not thinking about me? It's one of the questions. So I always say, safeguard your heart by constantly asking yourself, every decision you're making, wait before God first. 
what will God think about this decision? Then ask, how will he make my partner feel? Will he make them happy? Would he, even spending money, before you spend money, make that decision of what you're going to buy with your partner in mind. Is this going to help our marriage? Is this going to help our marriage move further? Is it going to help our dreams? Or is this a selfish decision I'm about to make? So make sure that every decision you make, you make it together. We make all our decisions together. Which school our children will go to, what dreams we have, where we'll build our home, where we want to retire, when we want to retire. If we want to travel, if we have conversations with people, we come back and say, oh, this is what I had during my meeting. This is what I said. What do you think? Make your decisions together. Don't be ashamed of telling people, oh, let me ask my wife. There's nothing wrong with that. There's honor in that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You must understand that you are one. Two of you are one. So every decision that you make affects that person. God expects that you're consistently remembering that I'm not just alone anymore. There's somebody who I'm responsible for or I'm accountable to. So if you're a married person, you must learn how to make decisions. Every decision, Either you run it by your partner or run or do it considering your partner. So it's important that you have it at the back of your mind. These are the things that will change your life because if you're consistently thinking of your partner, you are less likely to hurt them. If you're thinking about the goals you have together, then that money you want to move out of the account for something frivolous, would you do it? If you're thinking about your partner, that person who is having private conversations with you, during when your partner is asleep at midnight, if your partner was to wake up and see you, or that channel you're surfing, that website you're on, that pornographic page, how would it make your partner feel? Before you press the play button on that video, make that decision with your partner in mind. Either make it with them if they're in the room with you, or make it considering them, okay? So to make the most of your marriage, number one, make God the center of your marriage. Number two, make time for each other. Number three, make all your decisions together or with each other in mind. Number four, you're going to make the most of your marriage. You have to learn to manage your mouth. So that's my fourth M. I want my most important M's. You have to learn to control your tongue. Now, I'm going to read you two scriptures. I'm going to read you James 3. That talks about the tongue. And then, but I'm going to start with James 1 from verse 19. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. And this is James. I call him Uncle James because he's our brother, Jesus' brother. And Jesus is our elder brother. Our first, our eldest brother, the first among many. So this is our Uncle James. Uncle James is giving us advice. So he's saying to us, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. If someone tells you to take note of something, it means pay attention. So it says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So be slow to speak. Someone once said to me, that the reason God gave us two ears and one mouth is because he expects us to listen quite twice as much as we speak. And I believe it's true. Because if you do not control your tongue in marriage, if you don't manage your mouth in marriage, you are going to have a difficult time in marriage. I read you James 3. It's a bit of a read, but I want you to listen. From verse 5, and I'm reading the NIV. It says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. It says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. It says, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poisons. It says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And verse 10 says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. It says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. 
In other words, what God is saying is that if you can control your tongue, if you read from beginning in the first, first one from the top, it says if you can control your tongue, you will be a perfect man, perfect in all ways. When he talks about perfection, what he's saying is that you will be mature. Okay? It says you'll be mature in all things. So if you can keep your tongue in check, if you can manage your mouth, you have gone a long way in managing your marriage. The things we say have a way of affecting our marriage in two ways. Number one, in the words you release, the Bible says that life and death and the power of the tongue. If you say anything negative about your marriage, you have released those words into life. Jesus said, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They are life-giving. So the words you speak, because you're also a spirit man, the words you speak, they are spirit and they are life. So when you release those words into the atmosphere, they take effect in your marriage. So you need to be careful what you say. So when you say things like, my husband is a useless man. My husband is so annoying. My husband has no brains. My wife is such a useless woman. She's so annoying. She's so quarrelsome. I don't even know what's between her ears. This woman has caught in wolf or brains. I regret marrying you. When you start to say words like that, you're releasing them into the atmosphere. And if you're conscious of this, you also know that you can use it to your advantage, meaning that you can release positive words into the atmosphere. You can say about your marriage the things that you want to see. And even if they are not seeing them yet, the Bible says that we can be like God and we can call those things that be not as though they were. So you begin to speak into your marriage. My home is blessed. My marriage is beautiful. My spouse is my best friend. My husband is intelligent. My my husband is anointed. My husband is blessed. My husband is favored. Oh, I make the best decisions for our children. Our children grow up well. I don't have useless children. My children are smart. They are intelligent. When others are walking, my children are running. When others are running, my children are flying. When others are flying, my children are soaring. My children are for signs and wonders. They are for great things. You start to speak the things you want to say. Use your mouth the right way. So every time you feel Wrong things coming out of your heart, which is why I say you must first build on the word. Because the Bible tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's what's in your heart that you bring out of your mouth. It's not the other way around. It's what you've already put in your heart. So what's in your heart concerning your marriage? It's important that you manage your mouth if your marriage is going to survive. Now, how can you do that? I'll give you two practical questions I ask myself every time I have a conversation with my husband. Especially if I feel like a quarrel is about to brew. If I feel like he's about to misunderstand me or I feel like this is not, this is, this is not going the way I planned, I ask myself two questions. This thing that I want to say now, because I always have an answer. Hmm. I'm not even going to lie about that. And my husband says, I have an answer. <laughs> but I now have to learn to manage my mouth. One of the things I will ask myself, I ask myself two questions every time. Number one, should what I'm thinking be said <laughs> sometimes when we're having those, those conversations that I feel they're not going the way I want them to go I have a thought and I'm about to bring it up my mom's husband says what are you thinking I'm saying hmm. I say, this man you don't know what I'm thinking and I'm not going to let you know what I'm thinking so the question you ask yourself before you say that thing that thing you're thinking should it be said number one number two before you open your mouth another way you can manage your mouth ask yourself should what I'm thinking be said now Okay? Should what I'm thinking be said at all? And should what I'm thinking be said now? Those are two questions. What you are thinking, should it be said now? It can be said later. There's nothing wrong with that. But should it be said at all? It's another question you need to ask yourself. Should it just die? You know how they say, perish the thoughts. Perish the thoughts and let it die. Okay? So you must manage your mouth if you're going to have a great marriage. So right now, I've given you four things to make the most of your marriage. Number one, make sure God is the center of your marriage. Number two, make time for each other. Number three, make all your decisions together or with each other in mind. Number four, manage your mouth. Number five, make sure you move out all the love busters. What do I call love busters? Love busters are the things that cause each other pain. The things that, you know, Think of love like balloons all over the place. You know, when you're in a marriage, your marriage is filled with balloons everywhere. And as years go by, you start to do things that hurt each other. So I call those things love bursters, like they burst the balloons of love. So every time your husband does something you don't like or something that is hurtful to you, it literally bursts a balloon. If you do the same thing to your spouse, 
it does, it does, you know, it busts its own balloon. So I call them love busters. Now make sure that you are conscious of them and that you con constantly take them out of your marriage. Every time you know there's something your partner doesn't like, move them out and have those conversations from time to time because people evolve. When we first got married, one of the things I, I remember then we had a lot of conversations. We had a lot of agreements. We're not going to do this. We're not going to fight. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. But as I started growing older in marriage, I found out that a lot of things started changing about me. Some of the things that initially would not annoy me when I first got married, I found out that they started annoying me. So sometimes conversations that we would have that I probably wouldn't think much of. I started having deeper meaning into it. My husband would say something and I would analyze it till I brought out what wasn't said. <laughs> what was it meant? And then I would internalize it and sit back and meditate on it and build a house, literally a large edifice on that thing. And then after some time, I would start acting funny and he would ask, what's wrong, what's wrong? And we have this policy in our home. You don't sulk, you talk, okay? Don't carry your face about and act like somebody's maltreating you. You're not a martyr in this marriage. So say whatever you, you know, whatever is disturbing you. So say what's wrong with him. By the time I tell him, he would take like two minutes to laugh because he'd be like, you should write movies. Because I have no idea. By yourself, you have created a full movie from this little sentence, you know, that I made. So I had to, I realized that I had to start speaking up about the things that I was, you know, beginning to feel like didn't like anymore. Or, you see, the thing is, your partner doesn't read minds. So you must be willing to also tell them, these are the things that hurt me. At the same time, you must also tell them the things that bless you. Because a lot of times we complain about things we don't like, but we don't tell our partners what we do like. So make it your goal to take out all the love busters in your marriage. Anything that you find that may hurt your partner. Your partner doesn't like something, don't do it. Don't do it and come and apologize. Because a lot of people do that. Like, you hurt me and you come back and say, but I said I'm sorry. Your being sorry doesn't change the fact that you did this thing. And you did it intentionally knowing that it will hurt me. So don't do that. So have that conversation about the things that could possibly be lost love busters for you. Things you don't like in marriage. Marriage is not a prison. You shouldn't marry a dictator. You shouldn't be intimidated by your partner. It's supposed to be a love relationship. And love casts out fear. Okay? There's, there should be nothing... In your mind, I should make you afraid. Sometimes when people come to me and say, oh, I have this challenge with my husband, but oh, please don't tell him I said, I'm like, I'm not going to tell him, but you are going to tell him. So oh, please, I, I don't know if somebody can speak to my husband. If you can't speak to your husband, you can't speak to your wife. I'm wondering how you got here in the first place. So have conversations. Make sure you are talking to each other. Make sure you're telling each other what you need. It's so important, which leads me to the last one. Okay, so I've given you, make God the center of your marriage, make time for each other, make all your decisions together or with each other in mind, manage your mouth, move out all the love busters and now make it your life goal to meet each other's needs. Make it your life goal to meet each other's needs and you will have many needs in marriage. Okay, the Bible tells us that a single person, their only focus is how they may please the Lord. But when you are married, the Bible says that, let me read it. In fact, let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 7, 32. Okay, it says, I would like you to be free from consent. So that's um, Apostle Paul speaking. He says, an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned the, about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. God is expecting, and of course, the same thing applies to women. God is expecting that when you get married, you're not just going to be so heavenly minded that you have no earthly good. No, you're, God expects that you now become the kind of person who is also focused on how can I please my spouse? How can I please my husband? How can I please my wife? What are their needs? If you don't know their needs, you can't please them. You must also understand what their needs are. So make it your life goal to meet these needs. Meet their emotional needs. Your partner should not have anyone else that they offload on more than you. Not because they don't want to talk to you, but because you're not available. You must be available emotionally. You must be available mentally. You must be present. When you're having conversations with your partner, you must be present. You must meet physical needs. 
I never can understand when when supposed to say, oh, my wife, my wife has not been having sex with me. What's the option? What's the option? My husband is not touching me. What's the option? You got married to do. Now do. Because I hear a lot of people say all kinds of funny, and I say it all the time. They have all kinds of classic vows. Or amazing. Your moon is my star. My star is your sun. I see my babies in your eyes. The angels sing choruses when you are All kinds of things. And say, do you? I do, I do. When you are now ready to do. In fact, a lot of times, we have spent so much energy having sex before the marriage. And when you now get into the honeymoon, there's no more honey left in the moon. And that's one of the challenges that we have. This, because so many people are engaging in premarital sex. When you are now married, you are tired. And God expects that you are supposed to now meet each other's needs. So when you say you are tired, what's the person, the other person's alternative? That's why I said, make all your decisions with the other person in mind. If I don't feel like having sex with this person, so what do I do? I just let him be. So what's he supposed to do? Think about the other person. And that's why I always tell people, there's beautiful sex and there's beautiful sex. Beautiful sex is both of us are interested. And we're tearing our clothes and doing all kinds of amazing things. Can't do like do everything. But there's also dutiful sex. You're in the mood I'm not. I do it because of you. But I must act like it's beautiful sex. And you see, if you do dutiful sex well enough, it ends up being beautiful. But I'm not talking about sex today, so let me move on. So the bottom line is you must meet all your partner's needs. If you're going to make the most of your marriage, if you put these six things in place, making sure God is the center of your marriage, making time for each other, date nights, family vacations, making all your decisions together or with each other in mind, managing your mouth, asking yourself every time, this thing I'm thinking, should it be said now? Should it even be said at all? Moving away all love busters, the things that break each other's hearts, the things that cause each other pain, moving them out of your marriage and then making it your life goal to meet each other's needs. If you put all these things in place, I guarantee you will make the most of your marriage. And I pray for you that the oil in your marriage will never run dry, that the wine of your marriage will get sweeter and sweeter every year in the name of Jesus. I pray that God will release you to you wisdom and patience to listen for your each other's needs and the grace to be able to meet them in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that you will have the marriage of your dreams and that the love of God will fill your hearts for each other and that your home will be one that will be enviable in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you again for having us. God bless you. Amen.